Hey, it's Wonderful. great to uh, be with you for this uh, first of actually three, you might not know that, uh, webinars that uh, free ones that we're doing right now, doing one a month, this one in November, and then of course it goes into archives for a while. We'll do another one in December and then another one in January, and, and I'll push pause on all of that details. This is so pertinent, this message, and emotionally, I'm going to tell you something up front. Uh, <clears throat> don't envy the chair I'm sitting in. <laughs> don't covet uh, your neighbor's wife. Oh, okay, that's uh, Ten Commandment. And how about this? Don't covet your another person's gift because God's got plenty for you and you have your own seat to sit in and your own vantage point. Now the reason why i <clears throat> doing a, a little uh, parentheses before I head into this turbulent subject is uh, sometimes Actually, often, you get tested in the very message you're going to bring. And so, as I bring this to you, these turbulent times, how should we now live? I, quite frankly, I'm asking those questions myself. Now, I can give it to you in a straight biblical format, and you're going to have notes, and, and those who are watching in a video presentation have a, a great uh, PowerPoint presentations with these notes, but I'm going to be up front with you, and I'm going to tell you, I am not going to get through all these notes. There's no way. Well, I guess in God, there's always a way, but. Because in here, in me, I want this to be more personal. And this set of notes today is extravagantly amazing. And that's not like busting in me because three-fourths of this is scripture. It's because the word of God is amazing. But we often get... Uh, tested in what we present. There's a difference between information and impartation. I am not a Ephesians 4.11 office teacher. I have been a pastor, and I want you to know I love God and I love people. And so in that, in a, I am not a pastor today, and I haven't been for a long time. But in a certain manner, you know something? It isn't what office gift are you. It's have you learned to love? And I wish that was in these notes, and it's not, and it should be. These turbulent times, how should we now live? There's a whole lot that's on the inside of me that's not in these notes. So you can look at these notes, and they're going to be great fuel for you. We are in turbulent times, if you didn't know. Turbulent times are not unusual. Turbulent times aren't the... Only three times in a lifetime, like maybe going through transition. <clears throat> and I could go into and trying to define age aspects and marriage and the career issues and all of that. And but I'm not going to really do that because. But we all go through transition. 
And I used to have the concept of understanding, I used to think that transition was the abnormal Christian life. And it was special seasons. But I've had to adjust my way of thinking because as a believer, I think we are to be stable but constantly in transition because we are to be changed going from glory to glory. You say, well, but you're using the word transition now, but the subject for this is turbulence. Well, guess what? Transitions and turbulence. <laughs> They go together. And then, of course, we have the issues just of life. And what point in time in life are you? We have the issues of nations. And nations going through transitions. And I am here to tell you a transition includes turbulence. A storm, shifting circumstances, the waves roaring, storms. Now, you might say, ah, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Well, you just go ahead and rebuke it all you want, but I'm going to tell you something. <sighs> Yeah, some storms I rebuke, and they are rebukable. But some storms and some turbulence, Jesus is the author of. Because Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But then he goes on and he says, but be of good cheer. <laughs> yeah, row right, really, Jesus. Okay, you just said in this world or in this life, you're going to have tribulation. And there he's not even talking about the great tribulation, although your tribulation and your turbulence sure feels great or bad <laughs> to you. And you know what? It is. So I'm not here to give you simple pat answers. I do have some wisdom from life's journey. I do have some spiritual warfare understanding, and so do you. I have studied the Bible on this subject. I'd say most have not. Many people have been taught on what will happen in the end times or what will even happen in the last days and then the end times being the last portion of the last days. What will happen in the end times? But there's very, very, very few, but it will be on the rise. That is a prophetic statement. It will be on the rise of the word prepare. I'd like to get off and talk about Noah. Noah had a prophetic word. <laughs> Noah looked like an idiot. Uh, no, okay, Jesus said we weren't supposed to use that word, okay? So let me <clears throat> use a different word. Noah looked like a freak. <laughs> I think you're, you're getting it. So Noah lived through tur very turbulent times. And so, <clears throat> first of all, we each go through turbulent times, transitions and tribulations. How do we respond? How do we move forward? I'm asking myself these questions. And then I'm addressing it as concerning nations. How about the nation of the Philippines right now? Oh my goodness, are they ever going through turbulence? Or how about in the United States an election that even some people are happy about, and I understand, and are contesting to have a recount in different, possibly three different states? 
Well, that could create some turbulence. It stated that the president and the president-elect obviously have met and that they both desire there to be a peaceful, as much as possible, smooth transition. But guess what? I'm not a doom and gloom person, but it won't be. It'll be a turbulent transition because the ideologies are extremely different, diversely opposite ends of the poles. So we have our lives, we have our nations, we have the body of Christ. And then we have the Bible, <clears throat> and then the Word of God. It does talk about we, ourselves, it talks about times and seasons, and it does talk about a particular period of time called the last days and the end times. So there's many ways of framing, looking at, and addressing this subject today. But what I want to make sure that I try to do is be personal. I made a statement earlier that my goal is to not <clears throat> as much today to be informational as I hope to be impartational. And in part, I have learned a difference. You can teach something and release information, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so knowledge is really important, because without knowledge, people perish. Without a vision or knowledge, people perish. But then there's another dynamic. So, Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever you're the same. And together we're banking on the words of Jesus. And lo, somebody out there, what I'm about to say right now, it's going to go like an arrow into you. And it's going to help save your soul from the turbulence of emotions. And Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end. So listen to me. You got to have this. Without this, you don't have an anchor to your boat. And the turbulence of storms and the turbulence of the sea tossing and turning, we could turn to James, the first chapter, if we wanted to. And it talks about this. Or in the book of Hebrews. Lo, well, this, is, <laughs> this is not in the notes. <laughs> The difference between information and impartation is impartation happens when a person is living the information. And impartation can occur. I want to touch. The Holy Spirit wants to touch you in a personal way. And what has come to me is to give you a very simple declaration to help balance our boats in the times of uncertainty, in turbulent times. How should we now live? Jesus said, I am with you always, <laughs> even to the end. So Jesus is going to be with you from your beginning till you take your last breath. And Jesus is going to be with us through our seasons of turbulence, through transitions in nations,
And it isn't the Supreme Court that is going to give you peace. It's the kingdom of God of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, let's look at the notes. These turbulent times, how should we now live? <clears throat> Is it fear or faith? Which will it be? In today's global society with escalating of violence, rampant shootings, in schools and malls and public places, riots, tumultuous economic times, chaos in the Middle East, how about right now, fires started by arsonists in Israel, Russia's reemergence. I've had dream after dream in the past about the bear was going to arise. That's the picture of Mother Russia. And the bear would arise to try to regather her cubs. And that would be like an attempt to rebuild the former Soviet Union, in a sense. And that's happening. Russia's reemergence. By the way, I bless the believers in Russia. I love you. You're amazing. And with wars and rumors of wars, we have some basic choices to make. What guides and directs me? Will it be fear or will it be faith? Which direction will the nations of the earth head? We're in one of those seasons right now. I didn't say it is the final season, but we are in one of those Book of Joel, the Valley of Decision times. A quote from Corey Ten Boom that helps us. There's no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. I want you to place your hand on your heart right now, and you might say that along with me. There is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans and solutions. If the church is pushing the panic button instead of faith and trust, if that's what the church is doing, then what do you think the world's going to do? Because we are to be salt and light, and we are to be a stabilizing force in turbulent times. Will we be a part of creating the culture of fear? Or will we, and I'm not trying to set us up as imperfection. I mean, I'm going through some things right now, and Jeffrey could expound on it. And we all hit the wall at times, okay? <laughs> I cannot do this sharing without being real with you. I've hit the wall a lot of times before. So hitting the wall, now that's a phrase that might not translate well for some other people. Uh, it's a colloquialism. And some people in Singapore or, uh, you know, or the United Kingdom or maybe listening in South Africa or Australia or wherever, the bet it's like, you hit, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, uh, I don't know how to move forward. Now listen, I've hit the wall before and not known how to move forward, but he does. Because how are we going to respond? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because you haven't got any understanding left to lean on. Got a song popping in me. Lean on me. <laughs> when you're not strong, I'll be your friend. 
I'll help you carry on. Whoa. Somebody to lean on. In the body of Christ, we need to be safe people that someone else in a time of need could lean on. <laughs> I think that might have been a James Taylor song. Okay. Which option will we choose in turbulent times? Shaking or glory? Darkness or light? Faith or fear? Fatalism or furious love? Stagnation, which is where a lot of us go, or progressive revelation? Lukewarm churchianity or a passionate believers with our hearts still on fire for God? Your circumstances does not determine the level of fire you carry in passion in your love for God and his purposes. In fact, your circumstances should be used as wood to keep the fire even stoked higher. Which option will it be? Tribulation generation? Or hope ambassadors generation. Desolation or restoration. Well, I take a lot of my template for this type of teaching and understanding from <clears throat> Old Testament. And part of this then is brought over into the New Testament in the book of Hebrews and a couple of other places. But it's from Haggai chapter 2, verses 2 to 9. Now, I'm not going to take the time because of time, because I've already rambled a good deal to read all of this teaching, though it is brilliant, okay? And so, but here's a portion I do want to make sure that I read. But please read through this entire passage. Once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth the sea, and the dry land. I will shake all of the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations. Hey, there's a lot of good stuff that ends up happening when shaking and turbulence occurs. And I will fill this house that goes through shaking or turbulence, I will fill this house with glory. It says the Lord of hosts, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the early, the former. And in this place, now listen to this, this promise, and this one is actually overlooked. And we, we, we teach often about the glory aspect, but listen to this one. And in this place, I will give shalom. And in this place, the Lord will command peace be still. I want you to see Jesus in your boat of your life right now. Some of you feel alone. Some of you feel forgotten. Some of you feel like the disciples. And you're on the Sea of Gennesaret, of Galilee, and the winds have come, and the storms, and the waves are roaring high. I've been on one of those boats multiple times on the Sea of Galilee. And you feel like Jesus, well, maybe he's in your boat, <laughs> but he's asleep. And runs through your mind, does God even care? Does God know? I tell you, there have been times I've been in so much anguish in my soul 
that being even a prophet and being someone who's walked with God for years, I have actually at times turned to God and said, so don't throw stones at me right now, okay, please? <laughs> have some mercy. I'm trying to be real. There have been some times that I have said, I don't want to get out of bed. Could I just pull the covers up over my head and just pretend like this hasn't happened? And guess what? Guess what your choice is there that day? Get out of bed. <laughs> and right then, that's a hard decision. Speak to your soul and say to your will, I will arise. And speak to the power of the Holy Spirit resonant within you and say, Holy Spirit, empower my will. Because here's what, in the time of turbulence and shaking, one of the promises that God says that he will command. He says, <laughs> In this place, I will give peace. And right now, I speak. Huh. Peace. How shall we not live? Nashavda calls it, we live in a bubble. <laughs> and when we're walking in the spirit, we're in a bubble. Patricia King calls it, the zone. <laughs> the book of Haggai calls it, and in this place, I'll give peace. Here in Haggai 2, we have the historical recordings concerning the first and the second temples. And the first one was grand in external splendor, an architectural wonder of all the ages. And after the desolation of the first temple, there was a time of despair. And then a second temple was built. But the second temple did not compare to the previous earlier grandeur of the first great temple. And there were a few people that were still alive that saw the grandeur of the first, and now we're living in the time of the building of the second temple, and it didn't compare. But the word of the Lord came forth in that situation declaring that the glory of the second, the latter house, would be greater than the former. The pattern is similar in the natural and the spiritual. Let me do this very quickly now. The natural temple, the first temple was built in grandeur. The first temple was destroyed. The sec second temple was built, appearing in the natural as nothing in comparison. And a prophetic declaration in the midst of that is released. In the midst of disillusionment, disappointment, despair, transition, in the midst of turbulence, a word is released because God always has the final word. And God says in the middle of that, he says, the glory will be greater. The spiritual temple, the first apostolic church was birthed in glory. The church went into a time of spiritual decline. The second apostolic age that we are living in now appears on the scene in infancy and controversy because it shakes. what exist. A prophetic declaration is released in the midst of uncertain times and says this, the glory will be greater. I want you to say that with me. The glory will be greater. Now, 
countering the enemy in times of uncertainty. And so in my book, Deliverance from Evil, uh, excuse me, Deliverance from Darkness, there's a whole class curriculum kick, kit, book, study guide. You can just get the book if you desire. In uh, a chapter called Battle Plans for Overcomers, I teach uh, in Chapter 5 this really well. It's one of the best chapters probably of redemptive interpretation of anything I've done. And in there, I point out four of the enemy's tactics. Because, you see, we also, we're not to be ignorant, Paul said, of the devil's schemes. So when we're going through turbulent times, we've got to be able to discern who's the author of what storms, and each storm has a particular type of response. And I'm not going through that material Maybe I'll include that in one of the other sessions. But so now listen, okay, so there's at least four major uh, Satan's favorite tactics. Delay, deceit, distraction, and disappointment. Delay to weaken and to wear you out. That's where a lot of people are right now. We are right at a point of crossing over into something new, into this new apostolic age, into the kingdom age. We are right at a crossroads, but for a lot of us, there has been delay. And that delay is, is having a weary factor. I know. I've been promised things that I haven't yet seen. I do believe that I'm supposed to receive such a prophetic word and a destiny for my life and for your life that it's actually too big for me to fulfill myself. That's because words that we receive aren't just for us. There are words that take a team. Anyway, so one of the enemy's tools, and one of them that's major right now is delay. To wear you out, to make you try to lose your way. You can read and study about this in the book of Daniel, in the 10th chapter in particular. Deceit, I would love to get into that, but I did just do an entire series on the discerner to derail God's purposes, to derail you. And distraction, well, that's really simple, but it's really a distraction, just to get you off course, to help you, excuse me, get in a fog and miss your Kairos moments. But God's bigger than brain fog. Right now, the Holy Spirit is going to touch somebody's mind, and He's going to touch some chemicals. And I speak to brain fog, and I command it to lift in the name of Jesus. And we put back on the helmet of hope, a positive expectation of good. Now, the two that I actually really want to actually touch the most, is out of these four D words is delay and disappointment. Disappointment often comes out of magnifying the weaknesses of others, or disappointment because of delay. Each of these tactics is sometimes slow acting. You don't recognize them at first. Sometimes it seems that Satan actually is more patient than we are, as he encroaches in upon our peace, how? Inch by inch. He doesn't really as much attempt to derail us instantly, although it may seem abrupt when it happens. How do I overcome these tactics? I just would, I'm going to need you to look at these notes, and they're brilliant, by the way. 
Jeffrey has helped me frame this out in a more fuller context. And so each of the enemy's tactics are distinct steps. Uh, that w there are distinct steps that we can take by acting in the opposite spirit, like an antidote being applied to the venom of a snake. These tactics will help you to counteract and overcome the wiles of the devil. So here are four. I'm just going to mention them. And there is brilliant material laid out here for you. One, take action on God's promises. See, delay. A response instead of delay. Guess what? Sometimes just do something. Get out of bed, do something. Or maybe you're out of bed. But do something. Finish your portfolio for Jesus' sake. Do something. Put structure in place so cement can be poured into something. <laughs> we sit there sometimes in, and we're in the one that's in delay. We're in delay. God's not in delay. We're in delay because we're not doing anything with the. Because we get disappointed. Because we hit the wall. Because we don't know how to move forward. But I want to tell you, you might... You might not feel like there was a way forward. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I said some earlier I've never said before, and I'm going to re say it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and quit leaning on your own understanding because you ain't got any left. It's been knocked out of you. Well, some of you aren't there yet. <laughs> and I don't want you to go through hard times. I'm trying to help you see there's light. There is, there is light. I see it right now. You might be like a flickering flame. But there's light at the end of your dark tunnel. And when you don't know the way forward, and it's only disappointment and distraction and delay or whatever, I want you to know this. Try I speak to your hearts right now. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and quit leaning on your own understanding because he's the way the truth and the life, and he's got a way forward. And he loves you smashing up against the wall. <laughs> okay. Here's some things for us to do to overcome these tactics. Take action on God's promises. Ground yourself daily in God's word. See, that's where distraction comes in because distraction comes along and says, man, you got to get with it. Man, you got to do it. I'll tell you something about grounding yourself daily in God's Word. Sometimes it's one scripture is all you need. Yeah, do your Bible reading plans, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes for me, I read one verse, that's all I do. You say, what? Yes. I read one verse, and I meditate on that one verse all week. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And I need to get that on the inside of me. Okay. Things, ways to overcome. Take action on God's promises. Ground yourself in God's word. 
focus on the Lord and His commands. Focus on the God of promise, not as much the promise of God. And now thank God for all your victories because you see, thankfulness, thanksgiving is the, in a train, it's the car that if you put thanksgiving locked into the locomotive, that will release faith. Thank God for all the victories of the past. Recite them. Can't you just feel the devil already starting to run as these truths take root in your heart? Don't give these antidotes just a passing thought. Root them and ground them into your daily lifestyle and take action. And you will suddenly be looking at the enemy's backside as he flees from you. How do we respond to the last days? Oh, mercy. Now, this material is taken from the first book I ever wrote, which is The Lost Art of Intercession, and then a study guide called uh, Watchmen on the Walls. And so many years ago, this is based out of the New International Version, I did a comparative study of the Gospels of not what did Jesus say would happen, but what did Jesus say was to be the disciples, the believers' response when these things happen, and here's part of what I found. In these three major gospel accounts where Jesus teaches on this, in Matthew 24, he said to watch out. He said to see that no one, that you are not alarmed. He said to stand firm to the end. He said to keep watch. In, Matthew, in Mark 13, he said, Watch out that no one deceives you. He said, don't be alarmed. He said, be on the guard. He said, do not worry. He said, stand firm. He said, be on your guard. He said, be on your guard and be alert. He said, keep watching. He said, watch out. From Luke 21, he said, watch out. No, you're not deceived. He said, don't be frightened. And he said, stand firm. He said, it says, stand up and lift up your heads. He said, be careful. And he said, be always on the watch and pray. As I compared these three gospel accounts, and this is a part of how shall we now live in turbulent times. And this is the direct New Testament teachings of Jesus in these three passages. Comparison of these three great chapters. Four times Jesus said, do not be afraid. Four times, Jesus said, stand firm. That's like Paul the Apostle, when he said, and when you've done all, stand. And that's what Jesus said. And so sometimes when you're up against the wall and you don't know how to move forward, guess what you're supposed to do? Just get up and stand. Just stand. Take a stand. I would love to like just do this whole section for like five hours with you, okay? Compare some of these three great chapters. Put all this together and you get really good teaching. Jesus said four times, don't be afraid. Well, there's a reason he said, don't be afraid. But he said, don't be afraid. He said, I have overcome the world. Number two, four times Jesus said, stand firm. But get this, 11 times, <laughs> 11 times, almost three times more than any other statement that Jesus made. 11 times in the three gospel accounts, Jesus said, watch. So I want to tell you, how shall we live in turbulent times? We need to be alert to the enemy's schemes of deceit, delay, distraction, and disappointment. We need to walk in the opposite spirit and take action on God's promises. 
ground ourselves daily in the Word of God. Focus on the Lord, the Lord, the God of the promise, and now then enter into thanksgiving. And then I'm taking you to the three gospel accounts. How do we respond to the last days very quickly? And Jesus said this four times, don't be afraid. And now I speak to you. And I speak to some of you that your soul is in turbulence. What's coming? And I want to say your soul, peace. Be still. Be not afraid. For lo, he is with you always. And 11 times Jesus said, watch. The admonition, we're to be a people of faith. In these turbulent times, what must we do? How should we live? It was Dr. Francis Schaeffer in the 1970s that was used in theology and Bible teaching to release that statement uh, from out of his community of believers, I believe, in Switzerland. I was just given the entire hardbound five volumes of all of the writings of Francis Schaeffer. A very, very personal great gift. It sits on my dining room table. And what he was known for was this, how shall we now live? Are we going to be Casualties on the battlefield or warriors enforcing the victory of Calvary. The choice is ours. But we got to put on the full armor of God and we got to shine, baby, shine. 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 You are someone else's next light to give them hope. How are we going to live in turbulent times? Guess what? I'm on the journey with you of discovery. Yes, the shaking and the glory are on the collision course. But guess what the Bible says? Which wins? Or maybe it should be stated, but guess who wins? In these turbulent times, I see a glorious eschatology where light exposes darkness and the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters covers the seas. I'm in a huge paradigm shift on some of my understandings. I'm walking through prophetic parables once again. And I give this to you in part. But my little crumbs I bring to you today, I say, take and eat. This is part of my life and part of what I'm living, what I'm learning. And I offer it to you from Old Testament prophets picked up into New Testament apostolic teaching. And I bring you, in part, the very words of Jesus. Do not fear. Stand. 